Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Boyce of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Patrick Ryan. Patrick Ryan has been thinking a lot about how social media is shaping human behavior, and he's thinking very much on a massive scale about this, specifically about how AI is hunting after our attention, and so is placing things in our way for us to go after, and then how do we extract extrapolate that and then see this massive scale of AI influencing and reinforcing certain human behaviors. This is a very fascinating conversation, and it fits into other conversations that I've had, probably most with Vocal Distance and James Lindsay, and with Cactus Chew about postmodernism and the postmodern media environment. So if you're having kind of a hard time getting a grip on what we're talking about, do refer back to those other conversations because this does build up into some very important ideas. I don't know how accurate they are because they are a lot of theories, but it actually helped me to conceptualize, you know, there's just this massive madness that I myself and those around me are subject to. So without further ado, here is Patrick Ryan. Okay, right on. Great. Okay. Um... I usually just cut in. I'm always recording. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to, like, we can start with Marxism. Uh, sure. And why you found it disfavorable eventually. Well, what attracted you, it to you? Just being um, young and full of vigor for the world? <laughs> vigor. That's a fun one. Um, uh, I, I go... Um, I have a whole presentation about this in the thing called Dark Stoa. Who am I? You can go look it up, anyone who's listening. Um, the short summary is that I did not have an ideal childhood, and I got yes. to see very feral adults very early on. And when children see feral adults, one of the skills they learn without words, without formal teaching, and without um, any type of appraisal um, is how to not take off the feral adult. Because if you do, then the beatings come and everything else, right? So a child learns very quickly how to read human behavior. Um, and when I was trying to explain to myself how to get better at dodging these feral adults, I, you get in your teenage years and it's the 90s and the Clintons are elected. And uh, there's a grand resurgence of all things Democrat, including in the public education system. And suddenly, voila, Marxists just appear and say, hey, have you heard of this? Have you heard of that? Have you heard of this? Certainly wasn't libertarians in school at the, at the time doing that. So. Um, so matter of circumstance and timing, I suppose. But you get introduced to it. And I'm like, oh, this this is trying to predict feral adults. Uh, it's not wording it that way, of course, uh, but it's trying to predict why people are being in terrible situations and trying to predict, uh, you know, if people are poor, then they do these things. And if people are rich, they do these things. And so it's a really high level, early, early kind of like Fisher Price, my first human behavior treaty um, uh, treaties. So uh, that's how I kind of fell into that one. Mm -hmm. How deep of a fall did you take? Uh, deep enough to know that the Communist Manifesto is mostly garbage. Um, it's mostly just fan fiction, to be honest. Uh, the primary work of Marx that is the most relevant uh, throughout time and history and even today is probably a uh, critique of a political economy, uh, which is his forerunner to, to the seminal work of Das Kapital. Um, chapter 4 in particular uh, is of great, great value and importance. This is kind of like why I say like American libertarians are like super against Marxists, but they just don't know it. Um, because the idea of sound money and the idea of gold, um, uh, the, these are well argued in this, in chapter four of Critique of the Political Economy, where he's going through all of history and stating, here's the exchange rate between gold and silver since like Greece, since like ancient Greece. So he can get all those numbers and compile it. And he basically makes his argument that the gold standard that's reliable for international trade can't be trusted because people are scamming it. They're gaming it. Um, they're putting more contacts against the gold than there's gold in the system. Now, you can't really say that in the 1800s because it's the British freaking empire, and they rely on that gold trade. Gold was like Bitcoin. 
Um, so you just like they <laughs> sail into a country and be like, hey, person who isn't, you know, hasn't gotten past the Iron Age. Why don't you just trade me in this gold thing and you'll be part of this global empire? Sure. It's the easiest deal ever. So the onboard is really easy. And if you don't like the onboard, well, there's always guns. So so there's all kinds of, you know, everybody relies on this Bitcoin model. And here's Mark saying uh, it's not sound. Here's a problem. And that's the heart of it. Like That's the super duper heart of Marxism. Everything afterwards is derivative of all kinds of fan fiction and stupidity but but once you get into once like i was like an economic autistic marxist right not the not the feel good equality type like oh my i hate my dad stuff yeah okay so he marxist critique is still incredibly valid with regards to the way that people are just gaming financial financial markets up to and including 2008 and yep. all these bitcoins as well is that true is there any yeah. way to like stop that gaming from happen or do you just try to incentivize that in the best possible way to regulate or maximize the uh well, minimize that, the disaster that very question takes us down the long and dark road that is communism the idea of trying to prevent that type of gaming it's trying to prevent that gaming and it needs more and more control of systems in order to prevent it uh, but we've seen what that looks like the 20th century was exactly that trying to prevent that gaming getting that stable international currency of course then you know washington comes in and and imf comes in and now they're gaming it so gaming appears to be like this thing it, it's not going away anytime soon and you'll see it like a hard break in certain sects of Marxism where it says, no, we just need to double down on Stalinist Marxism. We need more stronger national capacity. And other people say, no, this is ridiculous. We can't actually beat the, uh, we can't actually beat it. We got to do a long march through the institutions and pretend that we are these guys. Um, so you, you have all these like splintering points trying to get around this problem of, of fixing sound money. And now we have Bitcoin, which that's another attempt to get back the sound money. So, so there's clearly a demand for a fair communal methodology of assessing value mm. that's always going to be in demand um but that demand brings sociopaths it brings parasites it brings people who can game the system intelligently and it it it, it gets messy you know yeah yeah how did it um from your point of view it seems like you were very economically minded with Marxism. Marxism is now kind of mixed in with culture a lot. And there's this cultural Marxism thing. And I want to you know, buffer it from the stupid caveat that I'm not doing some sort of Jewish conspiracy or conspiracy <laughs> theory, Frankfurt School, anything like that. I'm just talking about how, does, how do these ideas that working, work economically translate into cultural control, cultural yeah. hegemony? And what are your but, thoughts and take on that? It's definitely not the um, it's definitely not the, uh, the 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 certain conspiracy that I can't say because it's going to get everyone banned who listens to this. But it's more the Italian conspiracy more than anything. Um, Gramsci, so when, right? The Ramsey, right? Yep. So so uh, Marxism rolls around and it's all the rage for uh, certain sects of um, very upper class bourgeois throughout Europe. Uh, think of uh, Instagram influencers today. You know, they're going around. You know, oh, I have all these likes. I have all these things. Uh, there was a there was a weird history, and I think um, Bernard Bernard Russell actually alludes to this, saying uh, we were all entranced by the by the allure of Marxism when we were kids. Um, but they were engaging in this like. What's your diamat? Well, my diamat's this. Well, I have more followers. I have more reads than you. I have more books published than you. It's, it's the exact same influencer game played out in this stupid space. Um, and this kind of created this negative pressure where everybody in Marxism at that time kind of had this like groupthink. They had this like really staunch like in order to be a Marxist, you need to have these unless you have a certain amount of books published and a certain amount of white papers. Blah, 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 right. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have this like group think where the reigning pre uh, the reigning idea was that culture was a artifact of capital. It was an artifact of um, uh, virtue. It was, it was I call it virtualization. Uh, others had called it uh, conspicuous consumption. That uh, that culture was a byproduct of conspicuous consumption. So if you fix uh, the capital problem, you'll fix the culture problem. They're kind of making the argument towards our better angels. Um, but there's uh, there's one particular guy, and that's Gramsci, uh, Antonio Gramsci. He was a Marxist in Italy who was imprisoned, I think, in the 30s. He spent nine years in prison, isolated from that group think, or at least the, the culmination of that group think by the 1990s, by the 1930s. And uh, because of his isolation, he was able to take a very uh, 
unorthodox view on culture. He said that culture exists in dependence of capital. It's actually human nature to develop culture. Um, and so if we continue this game where we just assume that culture is downstream of capital, we're going to lose. So he put together the very beginning of this framework to say, no, no, no capital is downstream of culture. He inverted it, utter, utterly inverted it. And in the process of doing so, he basically laid the seeds of what we're in today. Being conflict theory and identity politic and yeah. uh, anti-normativity such as uh, is developed in queer theory uh, and other forms of blaming things on a oppressive power structure that we're struggling against some sort of demiurge that's controlling our every move uh, like some people think of white supremacy as this overarching invisible superstructure that commands and controls uh, most oppression in their particular life Th that those different kind of stories all kind of come from that or are accepted from that Th those are emergent of this practice getting to um well there's, there's there's a gap that's probably worth exploring if if you would like to successfully challenge those premises um so a lot of that is coming from the idea to quantify identity this this weird idea where we can put boundaries and systemic boundaries and make predictions about identity. Uh, we can treat it like science. We can hit identity with a scientific methodology for reproducibility and all the fun stuff that that scientific methodology uh, just constantly spews out. Um, the idea of identity being this uh, as tangible as a manufactured good, for example. Um, this is. You, if you go through Gramsci's work, he's making the argument to do exactly that. The di bring the dialectic material process to identity, to culture itself. Where you, If you don't know how to measure, if you get started on something and you don't know how to measure it, you just take what's already in the system and you just juvenile create a total inverse of it. So if there's like this, like this, like saintly priest that you don't like because he made you mad one day in an argument, then you go ahead and create an identity that's the literal inversion of that person, and you force them to slam into each other, and they argue, and it creates a synthesis. So that's that's like the dialectical material process, the culture that Gramsci was ultimately trying to bring forward. Now, when you take that to its logical craziness, it turns out that this approach of synthesizing culture. Uh, leads to huge boosts in advertising techniques and, and outreach. So capitalism, as defined by Marxists, actually benefit from Gramsci <laughs> <laughs> because they're able to target segments of populations using these exact techniques. Um, and so the synthesis was that, in the, at least in the advertising space, in the outreach and, uh, space, um, culture funnels up into the control of the advertisers and then google and silicon valley come along and say well we control the advertising distribution so now we control that as well so silicon valley is able to control that centralized culture distribution um, through its cost cutting and and outreach capabilities with the search engines so this is where shortly after this happens then identity politics in its current form that we know of today that we all know and love uh, it's here, and it's supercharged by that consolidation. You made me think, uh, maybe we can use Colin Kaepernick as an example of this, because it sounds like you're talking about woke capital and using some sort of, sort of pseudo-dialectic materialism to game some sort of identity and then invert it against itself. So you have, you have this company, Nike, that's making sports equipment that is advertised constantly within these games, within this very lucrative sport called football. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's almost up there with the American flag, but how central it is. It's probably even more central than the American flag. It's, it's transnational. It goes wherever it goes. But within American football, American, America is really strong within that. Then you have a uh, Colin Kaepernick, who's a football player, who's working within the system, benefiting incredibly from the system. He takes a knee, and in taking the knee during... Uh, the, the, that ceremony at the beginning of the football game, he inverts that patriotism himself and he becomes the black revolutionary. So he takes all of the civil rights, black revolutionary thing, and he distills it into his identity. And Nike 
jumps right on that. He gets kicked out, but Nike then uh, enshrines him as this saintly figure. It seems like there's a lot of this inversion of archetypes and, and messing around and distillation of all this history and all these signs and, and semiotics into this one image and then capitalizing on it uh, maxima, maximally. That's right. Even the semiotics are basic. White versus black. I mean, that's a super simple diametric. Male versus female, super simple di uh, dialectic. So even the dialectics that are used and deployed in America aren't even that sophisticated. They, they're just at scale. That's, that's its own sophistication. Um, mm. and, and so you can have simplified, unresolvable synthesis, but towards what, right? Um, yeah. what, is, what is this synthesis product? Maybe there isn't a synthesis product. Maybe it's just at least it isn't what it used to be. Maybe you know you don't hmm. you don't necessarily need to have uh, a desired result, especially when you're using such clunky instrumentation. Um, so uh, the the woke capital again that's all that's all derivative of even what we're talking about here. I would urge uncharacteristically a a very tiny grain of salt caution, and uh, here's why. I'm, I'm very uh, aggressive in my posture. I'm also very aggressive in how I go about um, inspecting uh, very complicated systems of human interaction to find exploitations and weakness. That's part of the Marxist training, also part of kind of what I do uh, as a programmer and as a all my history that whoever's Exploiter listening will find. Exploiter of weaknesses. There you go. Very simple, right? Um, you're the, the, you're uh, the culture hacker. <laughs> I've had I've had some success. Um, the uh, the thing I would urge here is that when you have a very juvenile and primitive dialect uh, diamat going on, um, it is so accessible and so easy to grok by even people who don't know any of the stuff we're talking about that they will see the conflict potential of it. They will associate and affiliate alongside of it so they can throw their local competition into it to take their resources and their opportunities. So there are opportunistic actors in this game, too, that aren't necessarily ideological aligned. And I would go so far as to say that the people who are saying, oh, I'm Marxist now, they're not. They're opportunists for attention economic games exclusively. Uh, attention economic games. Could you give an right. example, like take what you just said and, and put it into concrete metaphorical terms, like or just real life terms? Like how, how is that operating? What are you pointing sure. at? Uh, the idea of uh, taking an influencer on YouTube, the words they pick, the clothing they have, the camera angle, the light they pick, all those are selected to maximize the amount of people smashing that subscribe button, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's attention economics. Maximizing, uh, aligning your behavior to maximize the most amount of whatever the metric for attention is, whether it's views, likes, subscribes, emails, you know, whatever it is you're, you're, you're putting out there, you're trying to collect. Yeah, or, or just, or actual human connection distilled yeah. into the internet form. Right. Yeah. Uh, typically this is at scale. Uh, yeah, so this scale. is, this is reserved for, uh, you know, people who hop online cause they're attractive or they're intelligent, uh, and they want to go find an audience that can, you know, pay their bills, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with regards to some sort of moral or political activity that's going on, we can just use uh, what happened in 2020 with Black Lives Matter. And after the George Floyd uh, incident went viral, everybody was pressuring everybody else to uh, put a black picture on their uh, Instagram or their social media and so on. And then everybody was going around virtue signaling. So uh, most people were acting in good faith in that. It, you, I would never say that they're not acting in good faith. But what I am concerned with is, one, the bad actors, the opportunists, that will be able to use all that good faith acting in order to channel people into a position culturally that we don't want to be in, or even social politically that we don't want to be in. So uh, I guess... Um, I guess we we need to kind of move out and back up and turn around. But how do you see social media infecting and affecting people's um, well, the political landscape and then people's personal psychology? And what are you trying to do about that? Mm. Yeah. So the political landscape. This is kind of a pet theory of mine. I've been I've been working on it in is it an equation. Uh, not yet. Symbols? Not yet. No, okay. I'm, I, I will be on my way eventually there. 
Um, but one of my running ideas, you ever heard of Gresham's, uh, Gresham's Law? Is this about the wildly successful paperback writer? <laughs> no, um, this is the uh, observation in the 1500s uh, by, I forget his first name, but a guy named Gresham noticed that uh, every culture he went to, people hoarded the currency they liked and they spent the currency they thought was worthless. So in, in that times, it was gold and silver. So if you had $100 in silver and $100 in gold, which one do you spend to buy bread? Well, it's, it's $100, $100, right? Well, that's not true. Uh, people would spend the silver. And they would hoard the gold because they thought the silver was worth us. So it is a psychological economic thing, right? And the same is true for identity, I suspect. I suspect that people are spending the, the garbage identities and AI is hoarding the good stuff. Here's what I mean by that. Hmm. So if I was one of these woke capitalistas uh, with my Twitter profile and my blue check and my pronouns and the 10 different sexual identities that I put out there, and you see this all the time on Twitter, right? What I'm doing is I'm taking identity constructs that I didn't invent, and I'm glomming them onto me like I'm a D&D &D character. And I'm saying, these are my traits, and these are my, you know, these are my properties, right? And so I'm taking an, an identity framework, and I'm putting my place in it, right? <clears throat> so that's, and I'm doing that for conveyance reasons and to identify neurotribes. The idea of people who think like me, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm playing this identity game that's easily accessible and understood, and I'm filtering for people who have also uh, uh, aligned to those rules. So it's a, um, it's a kind of a good faith gaming aspect. However, that's the identities that I'm relaying in human form for my own particular cognitive defense. Uh, cognitive protectionism, for example. Like, I'm, I'm not intentionally going into someone whose identities I don't agree with. Um, I'm only selecting for the ones I want. Now, that, that's, that's the human spending the bad identities, the identities they didn't make, and the identities that don't describe anything or predict anything other than your own neural protect, your cognitive protectionism. AIs, on the other hand, they do not see humans that way. They don't see humans like that at all. One of the most Interesting predictors in 2016 of, of Trump's outreach, I think this was uh, Cambridge Analytica, they were trying to figure out um, masculine spirit, masculine essence, whatever that means, right? They're trying to find what kind of internet activities translated very highly and correlated very highly with masculine essence. And it turns out that people who listened to Wu-Tang Clan had a huge amount of this uh, masculine <laughs> essence, right? BDE. <laughs> <laughs> BDE, right? <laughs> so, so the idea of like Wu Tang Clan and Martin Shkreli probably bought you know that three million dollar album because of this. I don't know, um, but the idea of Wu Tang Clan being a hallmark, a signature of an identity, that's something that these identity subscribers in the previous game that I was just describing they don't they don't even know what the hell that even means. They have no concept. So what AI is able to do is it's able to correlate all the things that people are actually doing that they don't know and they will never know. So instead of like the, the 20 different genders I may have, or, you know, I, I die in the name of the cause and I get 72 genders. The, the idea is now AI is so far beyond 72. It's embarrassing. In fact, for the average person, I would suspect that a, a person, an AI will probably put that person in around 200 to 300,000 categories. Uh, vectors so, of identity. Vectors of identity, yeah, okay. yeah. Segments which, of identity, yeah. Which means what in a network, a social network? Then that, oh, that uh, that's the stuff that I'll pay attention to. That's the stuff that I'll manifest or gravitate to. That's the stuff that uh, people all. that are are into that are also into other things or behave in a certain way, buy certain products, vote in a certain way, uh, live and breathe Psycho in a certain way. Okay. Uh, what I what I'm going to call psychological lookalikes. Okay. So meaning, oh, I interacted with the internet this way, and here's like 10 million people who interacted it with the exact same way under this context, right? Yeah, so yeah. AIs can play the identity game for real. Yeah, so hyper intersectionality. Right, and that leads to later on concepts such as hyper borders, which I'll probably get onto later. But, okay. um, but the idea of, of AI can do the real identity, the actual identity, which, is, which can be defined without a sociological taxonomy, right? And that's the key. I think that's the key. Sociology and uh, like sociology implies a taxonomy on identity. So like progressive stack, well, uh, a rich white man doesn't have yeah. has has way more privilege than you know insert you know combination of identities, yeah. right? Yeah. 
So um, identity a value has value hierarchy based yeah. on identity, which is yeah, what yeah. we complain about because it's so coarse and it causes so much friction. Or it's so gaming. coarse, yeah. right? So that's the diamet that's going on. It's so coarse. I need something of a finer resolution. Oh, look, social media has a finer resolution. Oh, look, AI has the finer resolution. So there is a diamet going on there. Hmm. Um, but more importantly, um, okay. academia used to be the gatekeeper of identity. They used to, they, you, would, you would go through the sociologies and the soft sciences, you would refer to this taxonomy, this value of hierarchy and say, okay, here's how I would structure my research, here's how I would structure my marketing push, my grant proposals, blah, blah, blah. Um, and now what AI is doing, it, AI can come to the same conclusions with better precisions without that taxonomy at all. It doesn't even need it. So it, it's, it's able to identify what people's behavior is actually doing uh, and going without to do. and going to do without the taxonomy that is gatekept by academia. So what I suspect we're seeing is academia is about to get slugged in the face, and so they're lashing out because they're about to lose that control. And I don't think they know what to do. Okay, I don't well, think they have any idea what to do. I would be hard pressed to not say that they don't deserve it. Sorry, it froze up there. Yeah, they kind of deserve it um, because they they've given us these. <laughs> caveman tools of identity of in intersectionality that we see run roughshod through our social media and through uh, who knows how many friendships, relationships, and, and polities have been irrevocably uh, stuck, let's just say. Not necessarily even damaged, but just stuck because we're focusing on very bad uh, low-resolution uh, versions of identity. So, if academia is going to get slugged, AI has the predictive capacity to do that. Where does that leave us as human beings? Yeah, well, that, that leaves the, the great unanswered question to my pet theory is that does identity even have to make sense to a person? Meaning, if AI is able to put a person in, in 200,000 different identity buckets and vectors and, and categories, um, and the person... Will the person get spooked by the predictiveness? Now, we've seen this meme where people will talk on a phone and then suddenly an ad shows up and they go, you know, what is this like? Is there a digital ghost in my hand? What's going on here? Right. But that's that's a byproduct of that identity predictiveness. And that only gets better with time, by the way. And it gets more granular and precise and larger in scope. So um, the what you will end up with, I suspect is two possible distinct scenarios. The first one, what was the second one? Oh. The first one is, well, I'll go on the first one in the meantime. First one is the idea that in the future, uh, there will not be computers the way we use them. We won't even see computers. They will just, IoT will be everywhere. It'll be listening to all conversations. It'll be like the Bronze Age, where we say a thing and then suddenly a drone shows up and drops the thing we were talking about and says, don't forget to subscribe, and flies off, right? Um, so we'll be walking amongst the gods, and most people won't even understand how any of this tech works. They won't have a clue, worse so than they already do now. So the, the computers will be everywhere and nowhere at the same time, and nobody will understand anything, and they will describe it almost exclusively in spiritual terms, just like they did in the Bronze Age which has a horrible conclusion. The fact that I can't tell the difference between the Bronze Age and a high-tech society, boy, that's frightening. <laughs> well, um, I don't know. <laughs> it just it, it talks more about human nature. We, we finally can regress back to our Bronze Age roots. I don't know about all this regression. It might be progress, you know, the idea that the gods may have walked amongst them. It might have been sufficiently advanced AI. I don't know. Um, yeah. uh, but uh, then the, the second uh, conclusion of this pet theory about spending the AI, uh, where we spend the bad identities and the AI hoards the good identities um, from a ah oh man, you know what I I lost it, I will try to write it down okay. I, I hope that, sorry uh, you, you no, the job we'll, we'll get back to that, I just I want to dwell just a little bit more uh, on this spending the good identities or spending the bad identities keeping the good identities. And so let's go back to Gresham's law, which is I have gold and silver. And what would be gold in that situation? My true identity. Uh, for me, 
would be what my wit, my creativity, my hungers, my desires, uh, my pleasures, uh, my preferences, uh, my friends, and all, and being recognized in that way. And then my silver would be what other people see, what other people expect, and then how I plug into these other systems of operation. Be they activist in nature, where I'm seeking a goal in concert with other people or a religious vector where I am making meaning along with other people. Uh, and the silver would be that I can just very cheaply spend. This is, uh, I don't, I don't know what my identity would be in so far as like what I actually use in that cheap way, because I don't rely on my maleness and my whiteness and my blue eyedness and my Irishness to, to plug into anybody. I just rely on, I guess my tone of voice more than anything. <laughs> the, um, a, a handy model here would be that the bad identity is anything that's accessible to a human. So if identity can make sense to a person, that's a bad identity in this root, in this paradigm. Um, mm -hmm. Because... Mm -hmm. Why is that the bad identity? Right. So it's the bad identity because human... Uh, that identity allows for human coordination... And the human coordination that that allows for is inefficient. It's in, it's not competitive. So these players cannot even compete in a future hyper-real reality or hyper-real economy because only the AIs will be able to know how to organize people. They will be able to organize people more effectively. And so it's just simple competition. Competition. So humans will hoard, they, they will spend the bad identity because there is a homocentric limit to the types of organizations that that identity can even muster. Uh, meanwhile, the good identities, which the AI will know, uh, that will that will become the reigning champion of human organization moving forward. And that brings me to my point that I forgot. Now I remember. Okay. Um, yeah. When you look at your phone and it's able to predict, like shows you an ad based on what you're doing and it predicts, there's that spooky moment, right? And that spooky moment raises a lot of skepticism for people because it turns out people don't like it when their true identity is revealed. They really don't like that at all because there's supposed to be this arbitrage. It's like this dance where I meet out a little bit of information and you figure it out and we're trying to t trusting each other, figuring out if we trust one another. Walking up an open book style, one to one. Pff, I mean, there's plenty of sociological study, dare I say, dare I say the S word, but there's uh, plenty of sociological study that shows that that shit does not work, forgive my language. Um, so there's a very strong possibility that those who are hoarding the good identities are starting to learn what I'm going to call stochastic governance. It's the idea that, yes, we know your actual identities, but we have to like create this clown world miasma around you so that it, it doesn't look like we're gaming and predicting you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wait, we froze. Um. Better they get Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're back. So rather than a... Oh, wait, no, no, I exactly. That, what just happened now we, will be intentional. There will be these intentional breaks of, oh, you're disconnected. Oh, we don't know what happened. There's a glitch in the matrix, but actually it's not a glitch. It's just to allow you some uh, a bit of breathing room. That Then you like, right. can voluntarily resubmerge yourself into this... Uh, uh, preternaturally efficient uh, desire uh, 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 achievement machine. That's right, and um, that's um, that is goes back to my very first question: um, Does identity even have to make sense to a person in order for it to work? We don't know the answer to that question yet. We're learning. Well, we're learning. We're iterating. Well, okay, so I think we're talking about the word identity in a non-identity politic way. We're talking about. I think we need to define it. Because you're not just talking about my skin color. You're not just talking about oh. my race when you're talking about identity. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, part of the, that's part of the bad. Uh, that's the identity that gets spent. Yeah. Yeah. What's the that's identity the, that, that I save then? That's my volition then? My will? Oh, you don't, you don't get to save your identity. Um, you're on these devices. It's not yours. Okay. It's no longer yours. It's taken but, from you. But that, but that which we're talking about is my volition, my, my participation in this, my investment of attention. My attention itself is my identity, not just the mm -hmm. physical container and, and my gender and my sexuality and my preferences. Is that what but we're the, the, the actual identity 
can never be known to a human because um, the AI is finding correlations that you will never pick up on. Um, so your actual identity is a permanent black box to you. What's accessible are, are social uh, sort of cues and markers and stuff like that. So things like race, gender, all that, all that crap. Um, that is that will remain because that's kind of this instinct to to find patterns and kind of like make them for the sake of efficiency, whether it's a local social situation or whatever. So we're always going to keep doing that. Yeah. But those but those identities will not have the political power that people tend to think they have. They they that is, that will be utterly subsumed. There'll be a okay. grand play that'll make it look like it's a, a big threat, that'll make it look like it's having impact. But hmm. that's exactly what it is. It's a grand play. You don't think that we can become immune to identity politic? It'll just uh, be shifted more or less along um, different lines then. Basically. As long as we keep making new babies with brand new brains that don't know any of this stuff, that game can go on forever. <laughs> So what, what's most disturbing to you right now, uh, and I guess the, in, that you're most on fire to challenge or to fix or to counter uh, in human communication and social media or just politically, like with the Uyghurs and uh, other kind of social causes? There is, um, this is, this is a bit what is known as black pills, and it may sound like I am. I can tell you're a little black pilled. I I, I got that flavor. (laughs) A little bit. Um, But this is not all hope is lost. It's just that the hope is no longer human accessible. Yikes. Boy, that's a concept. Um, So I'm looking at um, some of the structural weaknesses in my pet theory about identities and AIs and how they do it. Uh, the humans are hopelessly mismatched in this fight and will probably remain that way for, for as long as we have electricity running. Um, yeah. The uh, There's no chance of an organic, it's probably the key delineator there, organic, uh, of an organic challenge to this type of stuff. It's going to be various different power players using the veneer of, of organic and astroturf stuff as we see in politics and, and corporate outreach stuff. Um, so one of the things I'm really, really focused on is what I call AI conflict, meaning how do two of these AIs who understand so much of human psychology and understand so much of of identity and maybe understands the wrong word, uh, maybe they can pragmatically affect human psychology. Let's stick with that one, right? They might not even mm-hmm. understand it. They might not even see humans, right? Uh, that leads to an interesting interpretation of called human terrain, where uh, human beings, as they interact with each other, it's not sociology anymore, that's gone. It's more just a graph of human connections and actions that are influencing each other. If you step back far enough, it has properties very similar to the weather. So there's a thing like human weather, where millions of people, they interact with something and a storm's rolling in, like a meme storm is rolling in, or a censorship wave is rolling in, right? So, so you can actually do like this forecasting of human terrain the same way you would soil and terrain. I suspect that AI conflict, and it's currently really mired in like these AI, like these ethics, these AI ethic concerns that just irritate me to no end, because it's, it's just the gatekeepers of academia trying to get their grubby little hooks on the AI. Um, but the... Uh, um, there's a strong possibility that these AIs are competing with one another for the resources within the human terrain, and they don't even see each other or the humans. It's just like this invisible conflict where, oh, I'm steering the psychology of these people. They're giving me the resources to keep my data centers alive, so I'm surviving, right? They're not thinking in terms of survival. They're not thinking in these kind of frames, but they're no different than an animal, right? They're, an animal will interact with its terrain to survive. It doesn't have a survival frame. It may have behaviors associated with it, but it's not mm-hmm. cognitively thinking the word survive. Um, so AIs are probably doing the same thing. So as as a result, you never even need to get to the Kurzweilian uh, type of construct, which is this mythical AI that understands everything. You don't even need to do that. Once it has influence over human terrain, woo, boy, that's a that's a tough argument. It throws AI ethics out the window entirely because AI ethics assumes that we can put a control on this process. I can't control the weather. I can't control that level of terrain. That's impossible to put a control on. Um, so instead, I'm kind of looking at AI as like these like wandering tyrannosaurus rexes that just 
march across the landscape and we're just like well that's that <laughs> so just dodge the damn thing um so because that's my frame i'm very very interested there's a very large fire on my very tiny ass to figure out how this ai conflict is going to play out mm-hmm. Ooh, but i i just intuitively i'm thinking you go back down to self-control and and individual i mean media literacy is probably way too weak of a term, but staring through identity and making human more human connections, acting like a human to other humans, and developing that sort of uh, I don't personification of of your interlocutor, having a theory of mind, acting not like those AIs is the best way to maintain humanity as it's being shifted and molded through this really weird, war, uh, violent landscape. That there will be there will be an endless amount of recommendations on how to survive this thing that I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. I don't know which ones are valid. I don't know which ones won't work. I have no idea. Uh, okay. So at, at this point, well, what do you use? Oh me, I. <laughs> <laughs> Who says I'm using it successfully, right? Um, <laughs> um, I uh, I do a lot of my study on anonymous uh, communicate. Well, first off, what I do is before I run to the the P word and politics and identity, I first have to negate um, the 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 medium of communication because that has tremendous influence on what's possible. Uh, so like if I'm, uh, if I'm trying to do a study on population or human terrain on using social media, the, it will never be spelled out in the data that there is a, um, it will never be spelled out in the data about what people didn't share, about what people didn't type, what they didn't say, because there are invisible and inhi- invisible hindrances being applied from the social media outside of censorship that does that. If I know my mom, for example, is watching my Facebook feed, there's an entire range of topics I can't talk about, right? And you'll never see that in the data. It won't even be there. But that's because of the the relationships themselves. The identity construct is there. The social policing is in effect. You can get mm. you can tease shadows out about it, but you won't. It's not actually literally in the data. You have to go out of your way to go like tease it out. Uh, mm. Versus an anonymous board where nobody knows anybody and it's just shit post or central, but no one's hiding anything. Everyone's just dumping what's on their mind directly, right? So I have to first like rule out the me- the methodology of communication and the medium of communication when I start like trying to deal with these problems because AIs are gaming the hell out of it. They're gaming the, the user experience, the, 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 uh, the UIs themselves, the designers of the UIs are having to make sure that their designs are compliant for, uh, for largest amount of reach and a largest amount of addictivity and stuff like that. So um, the medium of communication, just even acknowledging that that has limitations that are gameable. That takes you so far into this space uh, where you actually come up with this kind of like strange patience where you'll be like, all right, well, this person is obviously under the influence of some AI. So, you know, I know I can explain how that's possible. And that can actually like give a little bit of breathing room for further conversation. Okay. So wait, did you just say that you can, st- you, you're gaining a sort of literacy in exposing yourself to social media and other people in social media that you can see when somebody's under the thrall of these predictive uh, patterns, this, these mm-hmm. AIs that have kind of influenced people to an st- extent where you can actually kind of predict their programming in a way. Right. And then you can uh, reverse engineer that and either let them go or play around with them or try to possible. help them out of that. You could, uh, but it's not necessarily the individual. You're not necessarily getting down to the psychology of the individual. You're determining if that person is under the influence of human weather. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's more like you may want to maximize the amount of uh, calories that a single grain of corn produces. Sure, I have to get really down into the technicals to do that. But I can also kind of figure that out by looking if the entire field is being rained on. It's kind of like that. So. Um, being able to predict human weather is going to be a vital, vital thing in order to like identify like, all right, AIs are at it again. Oh boy, here we go. Mm -hmm. And so that can like, that can kind of create a, uh, kind of like a blase person now, uh, approach to it. It's like, ah, human weather. Ah, well, I'll try again later. (laughs) Well, and then you can have a whole podcast 
just talking about the weather, the human mm-hmm. weather. I was trying to actually, I was trying to build a, a human weather detector using all kinds of stuff, like um, using like based on where ad dollars are going and which uh, which corporations are sponsoring ESG and okay. shit like that. Um, so I was actually trying to do it, but funding right wait, now. Wait, so wait, 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 wait. Okay, ESG. Somebody warned me about this. It scared me, but it was one con. It was one comment without any context. It sounds like a social credit score. Is that what you're talking about? This ESG thing? Mm. It's attached to everybody's uh, behavior and their... Uh, but it's working yeah. at the level of the corporation, but it trickles down to the level of the individual? It's uh, environmental social governance, I su- and, and it can be conflated to be woke capital. There is some overlap there. So those two, those two cultural units. Um, and then in terms of rolling in social capital... Uh, ESG is a way to do that, mostly because um, the people who already subscribe to things like sociology and environmentalism have already drank that Kool-Aid super hard since the 90s, and they're not changing their mind anytime soon. Um, so that's mostly locked in. And then, so what, just, what is what is ESG? <clears throat> sure, ESG is when it's a methodology of corporate governance in which you say uh, this corporation is going to allocate some portion of its focus, its funding, and its workforce into achieving the goals of environmental sustainability or social whatever cause the jour you want. Right. So instead of um, instead of corporations outsourcing their money to charities. Uh, as a way of generating goodwill, uh, they take that management of goodwill uh, internally, and they in-house, make it part yeah. of their in-house. Yeah, right. Exactly. So that's 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 like the technical description of what's going on. Okay. Um, but it's ultimately it is a way to utilize market force to bring the political change uh, that you would like. So instead of going through Washington, the voter process, and anything else, you just you be Goldman Sachs, you say you can't have a woman, if you don't have a woman on your board, we're not taking you to IPO, and then voila, there you go. Right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's social mm-hmm. engineering at the highest level of our particular society. Right, and there's yeah. uh, social engineering is one part of it, it's unaccountable engineering. Most engineering is accountable in the sense that if you try to defy, if you defy the divine and the impossible, the impossible will strike back Icarus style. So there's accountability. Um, and even in voting, there's accountability. You vote too hard one way, this swings the other way, right? So there's a gradual accountability going on there. And in this type of corporate governance, there's no accountability. There's nothing, there's no amount of stock you can own to change that. There's no amount of um, influence operations you can do to say, hey, I don't like the fact that Goldman Sachs is putting this policy in place, or I have questions about its efficacy, or can I see the data of this thing actually working? And they turn around and say, piss off. Oh, where's my recourse? There is none. Um, so this is this is a intentional methodology of morality, a framework of morality, seeking the most unaccountable way to promenade, to, 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 wow. uh, to spread itself. Yeah, but it's really scary. Does it remind you of Marxism at all? Or is it related to Marxism at all? Well, I'll march through the institutions. Yeah, right? Yep. <clears throat> so you're sitting here, you're thinking about the weather, human weather. Uh, you, you jump on an app like Clubhouse and you interact with somebody who's obviously ideologically possessed. But you are taking, like, we, we, I guess most people on my channel will know what ideologically possessed means. It means somebody, basically a religious fanatic of any stripe, political fanatic, of any, of fundamentalist of any stripe. Um, mm. You're adding this other layer that this stuff is being managed and cultivated by these algorithms that are just after searching to maximize their attention or, or to, to block off as much attention as possible and then, and then manipulate that attention into more attention, money, resources, whatever. It doesn't matter. So that's, right. that's what I hear you're adding to it. Um, that's right. And you already admitted to being blackpilled. <clears throat> is, there, is there another color in there? Like, how do you uh, maintain your hope uh, your creativity. Uh, what, what's the challenge here for you in, in seeing this and delving into it? That's, that's a 
that question may border into Sisyphean territory. Um, okay. Yeah, you're uh, just doomed. Yeah. Uh, I'm just doomed, but uh, I'd like to see if I'm right about my model at the end of the day. I, I am yeah. semi-scientifically aligned in the terms of like, all right, am I right about this or am I completely off the mark? So I can wake up every morning and say, all right, am I right about this human weather thing? Is there AI conflict going on? Um, and I can test and prod at that. And that's that's not necessarily hope as much as it's like yeah. never letting go of my curiosity. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like a, a, a prime candidate for a William Gibson novel. Yeah. So in... The room that we were in on Clubhouse that uh, I kind of uh, was very keen and keyed into your, uh, I don't mean this derogatorily, but your shtick, your whole, your whole thing, what you're doing. Uh, yeah. You were giving a lot of advice on kind of culture war-esque uh, tactics uh, <coughs> and fighting against the powers that be, fighting against uh, these different cultural tides that are going on. Um, mm-hmm. Are you still invested in that? And on that level, what is the most, on the, on the purely human level of groupthink, what is the most important vector for you right now that you think we should be paying attention to? Or, or something that yeah. you're paying attention to that you would like other people to be paying attention to? So there's a, there's a heinous relationship um, between that corporate governance uh, unaccountability uh, and censorship. These two things work hand in hand. And when they work hand in hand, it is very feasible to create this veneer of a reality of acceptance. It's kind of like the Chomsky concept of manufacturing consent. Um, this becomes very doable and scalable. That's the key part, right? You can scale this manufactured narrative that, oh, this is fine. We're on the right side of history. Look at this. Because you're censoring all the people who can successfully challenge it. Uh, and even then the censorship, people need to expand the definition of censorship because it's not just like, well, I can still, t- I can still tweet. How am I censored? You know, that that's not how this works. Like it is so far beyond that. It, it's, it's like, it's mind boggling. Um, the idea like they can unfollow automatically unfollow people, for example, no, I, you'll, you'll lose or just not boost like my channel is just not boosted, just not boosted. Right. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't censor you. you. You still chat, you know, right? And you're obviously censored, right? Um, so there, there is this kind of like uh, micromanagement of all vectors, like identifying all vectors of influence and just like tweaking those so they can then turn around to Congress and be like, oh, we're not censoring anybody. We don't have blacklists. You yeah, know, shit, they don't have blacklists. That's not how they do it. So um, kind of like understand that the – Either the technical or the user experience or the security ramifications of all of this stuff, then the better you can actually contend against the censorship in the sense that you have to understand the game to think outside of the box. You have to identify what censorship can't cover. Right? Instead of saying, am I censored? The answer is always going to be yes. We've already answered that question. Is it 1984? Yeah, fine. We're there. Fine. Can we move past that conversation, please? Can we actually get to something like what can't be censored? And I don't mean by the law. I don't mean by moral frameworks. I mean what is physically impossible for these AIs to censor. And you start identifying that as your primary mode of communication. So you make it expensive. The idea is to make censorship expensive because right now it's getting cheaper and cheaper with every year. Every every new billion transistors that can be printed according to Moore's law makes the censorship that much cheaper. So moving the discourse from, hey, am I being censored? This is unfair. Let me go to Congress. Let me give you a nightmare fuel here. More black pill stuff. If you screw up in your life and you want to start over again, go be a lobbyist for Google. It is the easiest job in human history. It works like this. Google goes to the lobbyist, says, hey, go influence this senator. The lobbyist says, sure, boss, right away. Oh, before I do that, could you give me a list of everything they searched for at 3 a.m.? Now you get that senator's search patterns. Well, he's looking mighty thirsty. Let me walk into his office, say, hey, you need to make this policy happen or we're going to have a leak on our hands. Senator has no choice, right? So it's the easiest job in the world, right? So so this idea that going to D.C. and going to the law and thinking, that, get the hell out of here. That is not how this is going to work. Let's move the censorship discourse because if you don't move it, you're, you're doomed. I mean, you're just completely doomed. Um, you need to it needs to be moved to the what is physically impossible to censor what is too expensive to censor once we turn it into a technical argument 
the 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 okay. mighty armies of the autists will absolutely just churn oh. through it and find solutions. Okay, we need the autists on our yes. side. Yes, they they are the last bulwark against AI uh, domination. Yes, they they, they really always are. have been, even always if they put it together in the first place. So, <laughs> <laughs> what is mo- uh, too expensive to censor? Are we talking about two cans and a string attached? Are we talking about no, some sort uh, of weird cryptocurrency thing? Maybe. What are you talking about? It's also Stego. Stego is great. Because Stego, that sounds like a plastic steak Lego thing. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not steganography. That's the typing thing. Uh, stegography, I think it's called. Um, it's where you hide a message in a message. Okay. So, for example, yeah. there's uh, one technique that will take any message you have and make it look like spam email. So what happens is all the AIs will censor that, but the intended message goes through to the audience you wanted to actually reach. There's also the ability to encode a video within a video. So if you're getting censored on YouTube, for example, you can have a video that shows like corporate propaganda about the greatness of ESG and all the trees and how many minorities we've saved. You can have that as a presenting video, but if you have the right plugin, it switches to the actual video. Huh. Okay. And it's encoded at the pixel level. So Stego stuff like that, get just being a an absolute annoying bastard at the technical level and you make okay. their AIs work harder and harder and they get little and little returns for it, yeah, you'll, okay. you'll break this. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you send them down the wrong channel. That's right. It reminds me of that, the end of, uh, what, T8, TXR, THX, uh, like number, number, number. George Lucas made a science fiction film before Star Wars. It was about uh, Robert Duvall was in this underground vault. It was the future, and he was just kind of this automaton. He was popping pills, working the job. His wife takes him off the pills. He starts waking up. He realizes that he's just a drone, a cog machine. He runs away. And there's this huge pursuit. Lasts like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the last uh, quarter of the film. is just them running away. And it keeps on, sh- uh, the, keeps on cutting back to how much it's costing them to, uh, to, to retain him versus how much he's actually worth to the machine. And he finally gets to the top and then they, they kind of run out of pennies. It's like, okay, it's no longer worth it. So, so I'm worth it. Yeah. So yeah. Yep. That that type of that type of analysis is absolutely being done. They okay. uh, and we know this because uh, Facebook and Twitter, their moderation their moderation services, they outsource them. They could insource them, but that's too expensive. So the very fact that they outsource it implies that they are making those calculations. Hmm. Okay. So that's macro stuff. I I, I keep on asking you to go micro. What do you, hmm. what can the individual do? Or what should the individual know, at least know and do? Behave. How do we behave? You get um, yeah. like, like I said, uh, the, the black pilling, the individual, I don't know if the individual can ever break free from human weather because the sad part is we kind of rely on it. We've been relying on our own version of it, the organic human weather, being able to read a room or read a situation. We need that to navigate social contexts. It's just that the whole thing's been hacked. And so there isn't okay. really there isn't really like an alternative um, to that. But uh, I would. But you always... still interact with people on Clubhouse on the internet. You're still making connections. You're still playing the game. There's got to be something that you're getting out of that, and something that you're putting a value into that. I mean, if you're willing to to build an army from scratch, which is what I've been doing for years, okay, uh, then yeah, go ahead, do that. You know, but that's not really cut out for the average person. Um, so it's like. Uh, what does the average person do? Mm. Yeah. Well, see, okay, so so just pretend that you are FDR, you're about to go into Germany, you're, th- uh, you're, you're kind of ignoring Japan, but you're going to go into Japan too. And you, you have to mobilize the whole country. So you make it a story that everybody's hand, everybody's involved. Everybody's involved. We're, we're saving all. We're recycling all the plastic. Every everybody has something to contribute. So there's got to be a way for everybody to micro contribute to to your cause, which would be to gum up the machine in, mm-hmm. in order to allow uh, more uh, human forms of freedom to persist within algorithm algorithmic wonderland. So. Can you dumb it down to just little tiny acts of resistance that we can put into the system? Yeah. Um, stop giving social media your actual name. Oh. Just stop it. Just go just don't do it anymore. Just literally make up fake accounts. 
Like, oh. abandon your mains entirely. Don't even do it anymore. Uh, okay. um, so just, just don't I can't do, do that. that. That doesn't yeah, I mean, me. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what I mean. I, these kind of like one-size-fits-all solutions aren't there. Okay. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but okay. the frame, the FDR frame, the, the great patriotic uh, uh, effort here, uh, those who can do it should. Um, okay. And then uh, there's also like, you know, have multiple devices multiple phones burners like literally burners uh you should be having multiple devices at all times when your phone isn't on put it on front of a fan seriously just have that fan if it's on cooling you down use it to cool down your computer put the microphone in front of the fan because it will it will destroy the ability um to collect cheap voice information from the phones Okay. Um, so, th- I mean, there's plenty of those little tactics. It's a question of operational security discipline, which everybody fails, uh, even the very best fail at this. Um, so I tend to look at not so much of the individual action. I try to look at, okay. like, what is the statistical distribution that you okay. can get people to hit this major dependency and weakness? So that's, like, my primary Okay. Focus. Okay. Okay. I get it. I get it. You and Cactus Chew seem to be operating on a very similar level on, yeah. on things. So with that, uh, I just, my, my, my primary job is to try to connect that realm to more practical realms and stuff. So maybe I would have to get somebody on a different level that would connect you to yeah. that or, or be able to translate. Like I, I need a compiler program or something to get you, uh, your, your ideas to translate into the circuitry of the uh, common internet user. Yeah, that's definitely it. Um, but Which it's, isn't it's, a bad thing. I, it's not I, a bad I thing. That. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's definitely not. Um, there are, like I said, there are, here, if I can't come up with it, I can tell you where to look for who is, right? Okay, so there, there are people who are doing this. Uh, they don't know they're doing it yet. That's the interesting part. That's why I say look at these people. Um, teenagers who are using TikTok, teenagers who are coming up through Discord, gamers, um, they are all aware of exactly what I'm talking about, this human weather thing. They even have terminology and slang for it. To us, it's that we're old people and it's a whiz bang dang bangled computer at it again. But to them, they've always had the internet. Like I'm old enough to remember the world before the internet. And that's that's going to cost me in the end. Um, but these new kids don't know any different. The internet's been there forever, so they are already like quietly and autonomously developing these micro resistances. So um, it's good to have a conversation okay. regarding that, but go find those people. They're already doing it. They're doing this yeah. defensive stuff already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it, it, that's just human adaptation. They're they're just building a, another form of uh, wild west. I mean, we're always seeking that wild west where we can be free. Maybe not all of us, but a certain contingent of us are. I, I'm in that land where you know BitTorrent was the wild west, where I could get any <laughs> TV show that I wanted without commercials, and then along comes. Netflix and it gets standardized and now Netflix is pruning through all these catalogs so I can't get that. Uh, right. Those TV shows I have to go back to BitTorrent. So what is kind of a project that other that you're willing to let other people and the AI that's listening to us mm-hmm. uh, to check out? What, what's, uh, what's on your plate right now? Where can people find your work and get involved with your mind? Yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of my work is what's called basilisk compliant, meaning when an AI finally gets around to reading it, I'm not on its shortlist. Um, so huh. and and plus the other thing I like to do is uh, when the AI finally gets around to my content, it goes, oh crap, we didn't account for this, and then it just changes the AI conflict. So a lot of a lot of my work is like preceding. It's not my work isn't even designed for human consumption. Like <laughs> it's like the weirdest thing. It's designed for future AIs to read and have like a mental breakdown. <laughs> That's That's a, that you're describing my fiction now. <laughs> <laughs> we really are on the same page. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the li- hold on, shoot. You might know that uh, URL Patrick. shortener. So bitten uh, we, slash we need, uh, auto cults. Uh, we yeah. need to back up a little bit. We we broke up uh, after I. Oh said yeah, yeah. Back. Oh yeah. I uh, said so something. You, in then. Oh, I think the connection went mark. Um, so yeah, if you wanna if you wanna read my AI bait, uh, you can go to uh, bitly uh, b i t dot l y slash auto cults, and that's like a list of my greatest hits. Auto cult. Yeah. C u l t. Uh, yeah, plural. Auto cults. Bit.ly slash auto cults. And you'll see uh, you know, my greatest hits. Yeah. On, um, on another note, 
So you grew out of uh, Marxism, but you're always kind of, uh, it seems like you're always looking out for the, what, what, what kind of adults, there was a modifier for the adult. Uh, feral. Feral adults. Seems like the, the AI is kind of your feral adult right now. Is that, is that true? Mm. Mm, it's that, not the feral adult, but it has... Did you resolve your conflict with the feral adults? Did you figure out that particular problem? Uh, no, AI took it from me. Oh. That's what happened. AI oh. now has total control of those feral adults. It can activate them, turn them on, turn them off at will. So instead of solving for them, it just put them on a plantation and said, okay, you're free to roam. Bring you back in. Free to roam. Bring you back in. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Like a, like a army of uh, zombie boomers coming down the road. Yeah. You're like, oh, here they come. Here they oh, come. Boy. It's that human weather <laughs> again. <laughs> what are you getting at a clubhouse? Uh, it's interesting. Um, I've had people like beg me to get on for like months. Some guy was even willing to throw three phones at me. Um, so I joined in I see what it's all about. And, uh, yeah. it's interesting. I'm looking at the, how people are interacting on that type of app from a UX standpoint, UI psychologically, what are they looking at? I have this like shorthand flippant model I use called, um, uh, Maslow's hierarchy. People use it for like security and food and stuff, but I use it for communication. Like if you and I have a conversation in person at a bar, we're going to be talking about very different things than what we're talking about right now versus what we're talking about in clubhouse versus what we talk about in email. So the structure of the communication limits what is, what can be said. So, um, I'm and also it accent with, accentuates other aspects of the conversation. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and so I'm looking at clubhouse from that perspective and I'm like, Hmm, okay. How would I gain this platform? So I think I got a handle on it. Uh, right now I'm just testing it to see if it works. And uh, hmm. I, th I think I got it. Oh, okay. Uh, gaming it cynically or gaming it for the lulls, as the kids say, uh, yeah. 10 years ago? Um, a little bit of that. Yeah. But it's um, right now there's a lot of hit pieces against it. Um, yeah. And I suspect that's part of the buyout strategy. Open speculation time. So I think uh, uh, Dorsey and Twitter... They're trying to throw a $4 billion bid to Clubhouse right now. And I suspect that when you do a bid like that, when someone from on high in Silicon Valley, especially a vet like that, comes down and says, here's $4 billion, shut up and take it. Um, I, if I was running Clubhouse, I would take that $4 billion bid and I'd shop it everywhere else and say, who else can pay me more? So I'd make a bidding war, right? So to prevent that, I suspect that Twitter is doing bid protection operations where they yeah. will leak stuff they will go to journalists they will hire journalists they will hire uh teams to go in there and disrupt things to make sure a bid war doesn't happen yeah but deflower the virgin so nobody else wants to marry her right exactly sorry that was uh that, that was a callback to medieval i'm playing a medieval game right now so oh <laughs> Prima Nocta or whatever it's called. Yeah, prima, yeah, prima Nocta for the bid, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, but and so at the end of the game, the four billion dollars looks like a mercy bid, and if they don't take it, you can expect the full wrath of political shenanigans to completely okay. admire that. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, it's I'm not just to, about to the, the political unfettered conversations, so called. It's about that's all cynical. The whole thing is. And, my, and what I'm doing, yes, I want to figure out how opposition will try to take this app down in the probably next eight months when oh. politics starts ramping up, local elections yeah. start happening, election season kicks around. I want to see how they want to target this stuff. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm I'm so sick to death of the culture war that it was it, it's been nice a little adventure into an even worse um, <laughs> landscape. <laughs> Which is just like the the culture war behind the culture war is kind of like yeah. the, this is what's actually going on behind the curtain, which kind of makes gives me a little bit of peace with the uh, with the culture war on the human yeah. level, which is just just annoying more than anything, and possibly civilization ending. But this is <laughs> what you're talking about: civilization redefining. Yes, redefining. Right. So once you once you get once you crock human weather, you're like, ah, oh, shit, that's what's going on. Okay. Yeah. Then you, yeah. The same. You look. You look out the window. It's raining. Oh, put on my umbrella. That's it. It's that yeah. simple. 
right? Yeah. I'm not sitting there like, what's the electric charge of that water as it falls in its pH, right? That's what that's what <laughs> hyper hyper uh, hyperventilating over culture war sounds like, you know? Okay. Yeah. 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 For sure. All right. Well, um, thank. Uh, I'm going to wrap up the podcast. We could chat a little bit afterwards if you want. So, yeah, sure. thank you, Patrick Ryan, for joining the conversation corner. Uh, yeah, it's great. thanks for having me. Yeah. Hope uh, hope the audience uh, has a good time with this one. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what happens. You can look yeah, at the right? comments or the <laughs> ones that YouTube doesn't delete, which they do. So if you uh, do comment uh, on my video and it gets deleted, it's not me. It's the algorithm. They are deleting about one ev- out of every 10 to 20 comments, depending on the video. The topic. Fantastic. Welcome to censorship. It never ends never ends. Congratulations for reaching the end of the discussion. If you enjoyed it, do be sure to leave a review or a comment or a thumbs up or whatever you need to do to show that glorious algorithm that this is some good stuff. And do be sure to go and check that back catalog as it is brimming full of fantastic conversations. Links to provide monetary support are down there in the description as well. Have a good night.